All right, hello everybody, it's Brian Love with DAV, and today we're interviewing Tom Davis, who is a DAV member, Army veteran, and Paralympian, who will be competing in Tokyo, Japan during the Olympics next month. He also competed in Rio in 2016, where I believe he finished fourth and sixth. Um, do you mind telling our audience uh, what you competed in and how it went uh, four years ago? Yeah, so um, competing in paracycling, spe specifically a sport of hand cycling. Um, competed in the Rio Paralympics in 2016 and I actually got fifth and sixth. I know that the team USA website says fourth and that's what everybody says, but, uh, don't want to take credit where it's not due. So, well, thank so. you for correcting me and also pointing out that it wasn't all my fault. <laughs> no, it's on there and everybody says that. So well, try to, correct it. to go back just a little bit, one, thank you for that information. Uh, tell us a little bit about your career in the army. Um, and if you're willing and how you got hurt, and kind of how you've gone from there to where you are today. Yeah, uh, um, joined back in 2002. I uh, was stationed in Germany. Um, got to Germany right right before the invasion of Iraq, and uh, left shortly after. Did two deployments. Um, when I was uh, my second deployment, we were in Ramadi, and uh, doing a nighttime patrol, and Humvee ran over IED and got blown up and. Uh, Lost my left leg above the knee, broke my right leg, um, broke both my arms, fractured a bunch of vertebrae in my back, banged my head up pretty good. Um, all that good stuff. So yeah, that's quite the laundry list. Um, yeah. I, mean, I can only imagine, you know, I was in the Marine Corps, never experienced anything like that. What was that like when that reality hit you that maybe, maybe at that time you thought life would never be the same or what that transition, um, was there a transition from and there obviously was, but can you walk us through that transition from those early moments to, uh, you know, competing at a, you know, a global stage? Yeah, that was, um, it was, it was definitely a, uh, a long process. And I know this is something that a lot of veterans deal with is, uh, when they get out for whatever reason, um, you know, what, do, what do I do now? What's my purpose? You know, the, the military, even though I was only in for a short time, you know, I was only in for about four years when I got hurt. It was what I wanted to do. Um, I could definitely see myself staying in full 20. Yeah. You know, I loved it. I loved everything about it. And then in one instant, you know, it seemed like everything was ripped away from me. So um, I definitely d dealt with a lot of depression and, uh, you know, PTSD and, and, and all that struggling with, okay, what's my, what's my purpose? What's my identity? you know, so to go from that back in 2006 to where I am now, you know, it's, it was definitely not an easy road. It was a very, very rough, especially at the beginning, the first couple of years was very, very rough. Um, I can only imagine. And I think most veterans, especially when you said the word identity, I mean, that really stuck out to me um, as far as you get so associated um, with the uniform and your job and most importantly, maybe the people you're around, um, then that's gone. And then that's, that's just the mental side. Um, physically, obviously you went through uh, a gauntlet of stuff. <clears throat> um, could you speak a little bit to <clears throat> the physical side of that? And did the mental and physical side coincide as far as healing? Did one happen without the other? Or were they running parallel? Or was the mental side, uh, you think something you had to tackle first and then physically came along after that? Does that make sense? Uh, yeah, I think um, the physical side was something that I definitely, you know, you know, laying in a hospital bed because I actually didn't lose my leg right away. It was a, um, it was a decision that I made at Walter Reed about a month later. And I think I spent, spent almost six weeks in a hospital bed, you know, not being able to move. My leg was in a big contraption and I couldn't go anywhere, just stuck in a room. So, you know, and then after that, I spent another, I spent almost 15 months total at Walter Reed. So, going through all of that, trying to train my body to back up, to be, you know, my goal was to go back on duty and to go back to, um, you know, Iraq, Afghanistan, whatever, and fight and lead soldiers. And, and that was my goal for the longest time until I realized that physically I wasn't going to be able to do it. Um, it, it wasn't necessarily losing my leg. It was all the other injuries. Um, my back ended up having to be fused together. I, I dealt with a lot of back pain, migraines, you know, just chronic pain that wouldn't go away. And ultimately that's 
what led me to retire from the military. Um, I was joining a program where they would send me back to college and help me get my master's degree at Fort Leavenworth. Nice. Um, and through that, when I was trying to go back to school and everything, just the migraines and just physical problems and everything just kind of culminated. And eventually I just decided it was in my best interest to retire and, and, uh, and move on to other things. Yeah. I, I can only imagine that's a difficult decision. Um, but it's a special breed, uh, to have that goal to get back. Um, that's the first time I've heard it. I think it's in a lot of veterans, but I'm glad that even if it didn't work out, that had to be a good goal that kept you going hopefully during those tough times and give you something to strive for. You know, you talked about the mental aspect of it. And yeah. I think that's, I think that's something that's really overlooked by, you know, like service members and veterans and, and people in general is you don't understand until it happens, how much it messes with you mentally, like to, you know, I remember driving back home from the hospital every day. And when we lived out in Walter Reed, we, we lived in Silver Springs and we, uh, we had an apartment out there and, and every day driving home there, you know, there's like a little highway and to get off the exit, there was a, there was always a big pothole right in the middle of the road. And like, I remember driving home every day and it would play in my head. Is that going to blow up? You know, those kind of things or go into a, a crowded taking my kids. I remember like a 4th of July being at a, um, you know, like a city park with a ton of people and just feeling like all that anxiety and just being around everybody. And just, it's, it's something that, you know, you, people can't see it. So they don't really understand it. And they don't, they can't, you know, like foretell that it's going to happen. You know, that you, you can't anticipate that, you know, I'm going to go here and I'm going to, you know, it's, it's going to mess with my head. And then I'm going to turn around and take it out on my family or something like that. It's, you know, mentally it was definitely, um, it definitely took a lot longer to, to, uh, recover from than the physical, you know, injuries and everything. You said you joined in 2002. Obviously we're coming up on the anniversary, I'll call it an anniversary of 9-11, uh, 2001. Did that have anything to do uh, with you joining the army or is the army something you always wanted to do? You know, I was, Yes and no. Um, I was I was in a pretty bad place in my life when when I joined the military. I uh, went to college. I've, I've you know I have a bachelor's degree in in marketing and business management. And um, but I got when I was in college, I really got into partying and drinking and everything. And it just it didn't stop, and it led me down a really bad road and um, to where I couldn't hold jobs and and uh, I just really really struggled in life and. And I was, uh, I was, I was sitting at home one night and I was watching TV and the army best ranger competition came on and I was sitting there. I didn't have a job. I'm like 26 years old. I'm living at my parents' house without a job. And I said, that's what I want to do. And went and seen the recruiter the next day and enlisted a couple months later. So, I mean, I mean, <clears throat> Yes and no, 9-11 played an impact on it. I don't know if I would have wanted to do it as much if, you know, everything wouldn't have been, you know, like going on and, you know, they might not even have shown that best ranger competition if it hadn't been for 9-11 and stuff like that. So tell us a little bit of the audience about what you're going to compete in in Tokyo, um, when they might be able to catch you on TV and uh, what are your expectations of that experience? So Tokyo is the opening ceremony started on the 23rd. And, but I will I actually won't race until the 31st, um, the 31st, September 1st, and possibly a third race on the second. Um, when we actually won't be in Tokyo, we're going to be up on the Fuji Motor Speedway, which is okay. like a Formula One racetrack. So that's going to be a pretty awesome experience. And we're about three hours outside of Tokyo. So um, I actually don't know the broadcast schedules or anything like that. I don't know what they're going to show, if it'll be streamed. Before I forget, uh Tell the audience a little bit about uh, your website and where they can learn more about uh, Tom Davis and all the things you've done, like the Boston Marathon. Yeah, um, Tom Davis Paracycling.com. Um, you go on there, it's got a little bit of information about me, um, lots of other articles and and uh, contact information, race results, all that kind of stuff. 
No, awesome, outstanding. We'll make sure uh, we get that in the text as well with this post. Um, try to point as much traffic as we can to you. Um, I know I appreciate your time. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else. I guess I want to ask, you know, from all that you've been through, um, not just Army, you know, pre-Army even, if there's a veteran out there watching this that maybe is struggling with depression or PTSD or just simple anxiety, not simple anxiety, it's not simple, um, what would you have advice for them? What, what would be the one thing that you would want them to take away uh, from seeing this video? You know, when I, when I talked about like struggling with my identity and stuff like that, um, it, I, it led me down the road to find God. And that would be my biggest suggestion is to, you know, my, my faith has got me through so much. Like it's changed me. You know, my wife used to talk about, um, she couldn't even like talk to me. She couldn't be around me. She's scared of the kids. Like if I was going to flip out on the kids and, and what I was going to do and to see like where I've, where God has taken me. Like, I don't, I don't think any of this is an accident. I don't think any of this is, you know, chance. I think it's him leading me down the path of where he wanted me to go. Um, but you know, that, that's obviously my biggest that would be my biggest suggestion. And then the other thing is don't give up. There's, you know, there's nothing that you're going through that other people haven't went through. There's people out there to help you. There's people out there that you can talk to. Um, I mean, look me up, I'll, I'll do whatever I can, or I'll do what I can to you know, point you in the right direction of people that can help you and that kind of stuff. And, and it's hard and just, just don't give up. You know, I was, I was, I was, uh, I was training the other day and I was, it was going through a really hard ride. And, and, um, I remember seeing this, this car and on the side of the car, it says, don't give up before the miracle, you know? So just don't give up, just hang in there. I mean, it, I know it's hard. Trust me. I know it's hard. I've, I've contemplated a lot of bad things, but don't give up. That's a beautiful, uh, beautiful phrase don't give up before the miracle because uh you know if you do it's not going to happen obviously but i love that 